Well, good morning, everybody. It's Christmas Eve 2022, just uh, so that as I look back on this, I can remember when I made this video. Um, I have a little uh, cheat sheet here. I'm going to go over a bunch of the things that I learned while building this guitar. Um, this is a guitar that's made out of a pallet that was uh, at my neighbor's house. Um, and I built two guitars out of the wood that came from that pallet. So I want to talk about the things um, that I learned. This guitar has a WD uh, licensed Fender neck on it. It was one of the few components of this guitar that I didn't build or put together. And I took a lot of pictures during the build process, but unfortunately I didn't um, save any video or make any video. Um, but Today, there are a lot of um, guitar building videos on YouTube. Um, when I first started about five years ago building electric guitars, the reason I did was because I was always an acoustic guitar player and then um, started to get arthritis in my thumbs and couldn't play too much. So I thought, well, I still want to do stuff with guitars. I wasn't really ever a good electric guitar player. I played in bands, but I was always um, the lead singer and the rhythm guitar player. So. Um, when I started um, building electric guitars about five years ago, I watched uh, a ton of YouTube videos. Texas Toast Guitars was, was one of the first uh, series of guitar building videos I watched because they did a lot of tutorials back then on um, each portion of the build um, and the equipment to use and where to buy it and a lot of really, really good information. Now their channel is more um, geared toward um, what they're building and their classes and a lot of other things. But if you go back and watch some of their older videos, they're great tutorials. There are a lot of other people on YouTube that have great tutorials as well. It's just I happened to latch onto those guys because my son had just moved to Denver, which is where they're headquartered. And um, I thought it would be cool to go visit my son and maybe go see those guys at some point, which I never did. But Anyways, um, so uh, the first couple of guitars I did were fabric top guitars, um, where you take fabric and you cover the guitar with the fabric and then you put sealer over the fabric and then you do whatever you're going to do for a border and then you um, clear coat it and, you know, it's just kind of a way to dress up a guitar. So those were the first ones. They got me familiar with disassembling and reassembling guitars, although I've been doing it my whole life. Um, I wasn't doing it on the level that I did when I took those guitars apart to, to do the fabric tops. And I uh, ended up doing a handful of them. I gave them all away uh, to family and friends. And then uh, I thought, well, you know, I want to challenge myself a little more. I want to cut out a body. So the first one I did, I took um, a cheap Chinese Stratocaster copy, um, took it all apart and used all the parts to make templates because um, I wanted to make all my own templates and um, build everything myself and the first one I did was uh, out of some three-quarter inch um, actually one by but it's you know the the nominal um, thickness of it is three-quarters of an inch poplar that I got from Home Depot and I sandwiched two pieces together to give me uh, an inch and a half and then sandwiched two um, pieces of eight inch uh, together to give me uh, enough width to cover the, the bow to the guitar or the you know, go from bout to bout. And um, so it's a little thinner than a standard Stratocaster. And I I made so many mistakes on that uh, first guitar. It was a good learning experience. I started with um, uh, uh, Gorilla Glue, which really wasn't a great woodworking glue, and ended up switching to Tight Bond later on as I started to build more and more guitars. Um, so the reason that I built this one was I kind of wanted to upcycle this beautiful white pine, and some of the early Telecasters were um, built with pine wood. Um, there's a guy, um, Jim Campolongo, who was on Nora Jones's uh, first uh, breakaway hit album. He's the guitar player that did a lot of the guitar work on that album, and he's a guy who I have always admired as a guitar player. He plays a 59 Telecaster that's a top loader, and you'll notice this one, I don't know if you can see it or not, but um, the strings go right through the bridge. So this is a top loader. Um, it's got a single ply black guard, um, a 
talk about the electronics in a minute, but kind of my reason for building it this way, kind of, uh, and, and what it's got is a amber, I first, after I got the body cut out and got it ready to finish, um, I finished it with amber and then I went over it with a whitewash and then I clear coated it. And so that, and then I did a little bit of wear, wear on it so that the amber would show through a little bit through the whitewash to give it kind of that really old, uh, look without being relic. Um, this guitar is actually finished nicely, so it's not something that um, is relic at all. But um, so, anyways, that was that was the reason for building this guitar and where I got started. Um, it's got uh, CTS pots, an orange drop capacitor, Oak Grigsby switch, um, cloth pushback wiring. Um, and it's, uh, the way that if you took an older fender apart, it would be very similar components, um, high quality components. Um, I was never a Alnico pickup guy. I was, I always had guitars that had ceramic pickups. I, I shouldn't say I always had guitars. I had DiMarzio's and Seymour Duncan's and Lawler pickups and standard, uh, 490, 490R and 498T and, in Les Pauls, I have, I still have a um, SG that's got P90s in it, um, you know, Gibson P90s. So I've had all kinds of pickups, but I, b because I wasn't much of an electric guitar player, I really didn't know what sound I was going for. And it wasn't until I started watching John Robson's guitar channel out of the UK years ago, and since have become friends with John, um, that I started to develop an appreciation for Alnico pickups. So this is one of the first guitars that I consciously made a decision to put Alnico's in. The other guitar that I did that on was the um, one that I did a video on a couple of weeks ago that was the blue um, Telecaster Custom that was um, built out of this same palette. I put a set of Vance and Alnico uh, 1957 PAF style pickups in. I wasn't much of a humbucker guy then. I'm, I'm kind of starting to come around to playing some humbuckers, um, but I've always been kind of a single coil guy. So um, with this one, I, I didn't want to spend a ton of money on pickups. And I thought I would go on the forums and find out what some of the um, pickup ideas were. And um, everybody's talking about tone riders. Some people didn't like them because they're made in China, but um, Fender was using them in some of the higher end Squires. Um, and so I bought a set of the, let me see here what they are. They are the TRT2 Hot Classic Alnico 3 single coils in this guitar. If I were a better guitar player and, a, and more of a Telecaster player, I mean, I love Telecaster guitars and that's pretty much what I play every day, but I don't play that uh, country style of, of double stops and a lot of um, twangy notes. But if that were the kind of uh, guitar that I played, or that was the style that I played, these pickups would be spectacular because they are, they're bright, they're crisp. Um, I really like them, but I've come to like another um, type of pickup uh, better, and that's what I've used in successive builds uh, since I built this guitar. So one of the interesting things about this guitar that was a big learning experience for me was gluing all these pieces of pine together. Um, so I, I built a, um, a, a box to set everything up in to make gluing easier, to make planing it down easier, because I didn't have um, a planer at the time that was wide enough to run a whole guitar body through. Um, and one of the things that happened was um, when you glue all this stuff together, uh, you're, you're kind of adding strength because the wood's going in different directions. If you can see the end grain here, you can see that um, the wood, uh, the grain alignment in the wood, I, I put a bunch of different ways to try and make sure that it was really strong when it went together. Um, and then one of the things I learned from Texas Toast was to use um, an epoxy resin as a sealer. Um, and I thought, well, that'll be great on this because there's so many joints that it's going to need a lot of sealing. And so um, there's a product, product out of California that they use. I tried it. It was really expensive. And a buddy of mine who's in the boat building business looked at it, looked at the components and told me, he goes, that's just fiberglass resin. So on this one, I just bought, um, I went down to Walmart and, and bought the Bondo uh, brand fiberglass resin. And um, it, it sets up hard as a rock. Um, this guitar, one of the things I did here, and I, you can't really see it because it's such a minor difference, but the, 
back end of the guitar is a, just a tiny bit wider than the front end. When I was planing it, I had a problem with the planer, and I thought, well, I don't want to start all over again and replane this thing. But then I thought, well, maybe I'll make that work to my advantage because the neck pocket will be a little bit um, shallower. The, the heel will be a little bit shallower, and that'll actually give me better upper fret access. And so I decided to keep it that way, and I'm glad I did. This guitar, by the way, is going to my son, um, along with another guitar that I'm going to do a deep dive on. Um, but anyways, what happened was I put the sealer on. I let it sit for probably two weeks. It was hard as a rock, um, and I didn't have the equipment to spray it on. I, I The only spraying that I've done on any of the guitars I built is with water-based, because unless you have a gun washer, um, it's really difficult to clean solvent-based or, or hardened products out of a gun. Um, and I used the Menwax Polycrylic, um, which you can thin, you can tint, you can do all kinds of cool stuff with it, and you clean it up with soap and water. So, you know, I had a little work area in my garage, and I would spray it, and I would take the paint gun, go in the kitchen, set up two sides of the sink, one side with soapy water, and the other side for rinsing it out, and then put a towel on the, on the granite countertop, and and then go out in the garage and blow them out with air and dry them out. And I, I got the cheapest Harbor Freight guns you can get, but I spent some time in the automotive business. Um, actually had a supply company in Baltimore, and I sold Paul Reed Smith um, PRS guitars, their clear coat for a year or two, and spent a lot of time with my technicians in um, teaching them how to use the product more cost efficiently, because they had a lot of, they would put on a ton of material and then, um, sand it off and, and buff it off and we were telling them listen you guys are using three times as much clear coat as we had we had done a tour of uh fender and we had seen what they were doing at gibson and um my technicians told them you can go with less material and um end up with the same finish quality so over the course of i want to say it was probably two years uh my technicians and i spent a lot of time in the factory helping them get to that next level and then were unceremoniously dropped for another supplier um, right at the end of that time. But I learned a lot in that process. And so, again, um, not, not being able to use solvent-based products, um, I sprayed this Minwax Polycrylic, and it comes out very similar to nitrocellulose lacquer. When I was a kid, I did a lot of motorcycle um, work and used a, a DuPont um, nitrocellulose lacquer clear coat to finish uh, motorcycle tanks and stuff like that. The stuff wasn't very good because it wasn't durable against gas, but it went down so slick and it was so easy to sand and it was so easy to buff and this stuff works the same way. The problem with it is, and I had two problems with this guitar that were probably two of the biggest learning things um, that when I go to build my next guitar, which is going to be a neck through telly um, built out of uh, uh, I put the neck together uh, last year. I think it's five piece rosewood and walnut. And then the wings are going to be built out of the rosewood that I have left. Um, so it's going to be a, a cool guitar. And that'll be one that I'll keep for myself probably for a long time. Um, I don't have a place to work right now. I'm in between um, houses. So uh, I don't have a garage to set up in or a workshop. And when that's done, um, I'm going to build that guitar. But um, the things I learned on this one are going to be critical, especially with that laminated neck and a lot of glue joints on the body, um, is that you got to give this stuff a long time to set. You know, you, even the even the uh, acrylic um, or the epoxy resin, even it even that shrinks into the wood and it shrinks into the cracks. You can't really see it on this guitar uh, up close. Um, if, if, if I could get like a microscopic view, you could see some of the places where it actually shrunk into these things two or three months after I was done with the guitar. Um, and lacquer has a tendency to do the same thing. Uh, two component hardened clear coat, which you can buy in rattle cans. And I thought about doing that at, uh, at different times, but probably by the time I get my garage or my workshop set up, Next, I'm going to have a gun cleaner. I'm going to be able to shoot um, catalyzed clear coat. Um, I don't like the poly finishes as well. I don't think they look as nice, but I have real reactive um, skin. And so my forearm where it rides here on my Martins and on my Gibsons that are all nitrocellulose lacquer, it takes <laughs> my forearm will take the lacquer off. And that's why 
most of the guitars I have that, that look nice um, have a polyurethane finish. And honestly, that's one of the reasons I'm giving this guitar to my son. He doesn't have that issue, and this guitar looks beautiful, and um, it'll stay beautiful as long as he owns it, and I don't play it. So. <laughs> Anyways, um, so those are a couple of the things that uh, I learned. Number one, um, it, the stuff will shrink for a long, long time. Um, and so when you uh, use any component on a guitar that's got a lot of glue joints, and again, this one does, and my um, upcoming Telecaster build will also have, uh, it'll have the five-piece laminated neck and then the two wings glued on. And I'll probably do the glue joints on the wings like a Firebird, where there's a V-groove cut in the body and a, and a V that um, joins uh, that joint so that um, makes it a little stiffer and keeps the you know potential for it to for the body to warp later on um, at a lower level um, and with dissimilar woods you know gluing all this pine together pine is uh, has a lot of pitch and sap in it anyways which is another thing I found out uh, building this guitar is that some of these knots that were in the palette and some of the nail holes like there's a nail hole, like you can see that was the shape of the nail <laughs> that was through that piece of the wood. And that, I filled that with uh, body plastic Bondo. Um, but uh, where those things were, um, sap came out of the wood for a couple of days because of the solvent in the, um, in the, in the uh, two-part uh, epoxy. And in, even in the polycrylic, even though it's a water-based product, there's a little bit of solvent in there and that, that will cause um, woods that have um, sap in them to bleed some of that sap out. So if I was if I was going to say the most important lesson I learned building this guitar, um, it would be when you apply your sealer, whatever it is, um, and I started using the epoxy resin because of the fabric tops that I was doing, you really needed something thick to cover that fabric so that when you sanded it all off, you would be able to spray clear coat over it and not have uh, the fabric pattern on there. And same with these multi, um, multi laminate pieces where you wanted a, you know, a, a perfectly flat surface. You really have, there's a lot of filling that has to go in. And surprisingly enough, because the pine's relatively light, even though the, um, uh, the, the epoxy is, is heavy, this guitar is still only about six pounds. It's one of my lighter tellies. So, um, so anyways, uh, give your give your guitar time to cure. Give it a lot of time to cure um, in each of the finish stages. Uh, even if it's a two-piece ash body or even if it's a one-piece body because different woods have different grain in them that absorb at a different rate. And um, again, if you watch enough YouTube videos and listen to the guys that do this on an ongoing basis, especially like Texas Test, now they're producing a lot more guitars than they were when the channel first started. Um, they'll tell you, they let them sit for a long time before they come back and start putting the finish to them. So that's probably the critical thing. Um, I'm sure I learned a lot of other things, um, but that would be my, my number one suggestion. And um, so with that, I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas, a happy 2023. And um, thanks for watching. I hope, I hope this was informative in some little way. And uh, wish all you the best.